Hello, my name is George English. I'm the Director of Research Through People. And we're making this video for those of you with ancestors from England, from the green and present land of England. Uh, a country obviously with a lot of history, a lot of different areas and so on and so forth. So we want to try and help you understand how we go about bringing your ancestors to life. And we'll use one or two examples that may give you a better idea of what may be involved in doing this. So let's have a look. <laughs> So here, here's England, all the various counties, and of course there's lots of variation. Um, London, the southeast, uh, West Country, East Anglia, the Midlands, uh, the North. Um, it's always fascinating to me the way we have accents or local humour, all the rest of it, characteristics. So there are variations. At the same time, everyone in England and our ancestors share a, a common background over the centuries. And our ancestors, many of them stayed in the same place, but a lot of them moved around either within England or went abroad, or of course, others came in to England from other countries. If you go right back to the 16th and 17th century, the Reformation, a lot of Protestant refugees came across from uh, Flanders, France, uh, Holland, um, <clears throat> and settled here, spoke French and Dutch, obviously at first, before they picked up English. So they came into England. Um, within England, big, big event was the Industrial Revolution, where the United Kingdom was the first industrialized country in the world and uh, had tremendous impacts. And of course, a lot of people left the country in rural areas and went to the towns and cities <clears throat> where the new factories and uh, employment was. And with that, the British Empire uh, around the world, America, Australia, many other countries, and a lot of the British people went abroad uh, and emigrated to, to live in these countries. Um, and very often we get contacted by their descendants to say, would you please research my English or British ancestors? And then disastrous events like in the mid 1800s, there were years of famine in Ireland, terrible thing because a million people died and another million emigrated. Some came to England and Scotland and America and various places. And all these movements we have to track when we're looking back uh, at people's ancestors. Now, what's involved in tracing ancestry? What are the chances of finding your ancestors? And the key thing really is three. One is, did your ancestors do something that caused them to be recorded? Secondly, has that record survived? And thirdly, can we find it? <laughs> Uh, sometimes easier, sometimes more difficult. Now, the four big factors that affect that, the status, obviously nobility, royalty and people, their uh, records and doings were recorded much more readily than, than someone from a, a rural background or a, a worker. <clears throat> but then various other categories, landowners, clearly their land was recorded and very often for tax reasons. Um, different work, professions, trades, employees of organisations, their records were kept. And then things like passenger lists are becoming much more available now of people uh, leaving England or coming to England. And even the poor, even those living in a workhouse, they had good records. So what sort of records do we look at? Well, the obvious ones are the birth, marriage and death records. An official registration started in England from 1837. And then the census started around that time, 1841. They're released and taken every 10 years and give us a lot of information about the family, how old people were, where they were born, what their occupations were, and really help in bringing them to life. <clears throat> uh, before then, we're mainly reliant on parish and church registers for recording baptisms, marriages, and burials. But there's all sorts of other records, such as wills, gravestones, newspapers, and so on, that we may look at to try and find out more about your ancestors. <clears throat> name. Now clearly if you've got a very common name like John Smith, uh, much more difficult to find and identify the specific individual as opposed to one, someone with a very unusual name. <clears throat> and then continuity. Did they live in the same place or move around? And by and large, two or more hundred years ago, most people stayed in the same place. Many seldom went more than 10 miles from where they were born, whereas now of course people move around the place much more freely. <clears throat> and enough, a plus there is that with 
digitization and the internet and so on and so forth, our ability to access records is so much better than it was in the past. And we can research around the world in a way that wouldn't have been possible even a few years ago. And therefore, typically, we can find so much more than people in the past could have done. So let's look at some examples. So here we have family Rutter. George Rutter's born 1903 in Hatton, which was in Cheshire. His parents also came from Cheshire. In fact, we'll find the Rutters stayed in Cheshire for a number of generations. Um, in the 1800s, that wasn't all that common because as the Industrial Revolution took hold, many people moved to towns and cities. Um, but if we look at what they did, <clears throat> Thomas Rutter was a railway worker. In fact, he'd been a farm worker before then and would have been one of the first to work on the railways as they were <clears throat> uh, built around the country and made such an amazing difference. His son was a gardener, Thomas. His son, John, was a farm labourer. And George Rutter was a driver and mechanic. All sorts of jobs where you could find employment in your local area. So all of these places are within Cheshire. And one of the obvious things to do in this case is to find out where these places were and help you, if it's your ancestors, to locate where they lived and hopefully go and walk in their ancestors' footsteps. So we'll look at a, a map, which we've prepared in a moment. So Thomas and Sarah in Norley and Crowton, they moved to Hatton. Mary is in Wildersport. So let's have a look at that. <clears throat> what we do here, we use a Google Earth map to plot where the various places that people live are. So here we have Crowton and Norley down here, Hatton a few miles to the north, there's Wildersport. And there's other places that the Rutters lived in the particularly the 19th century and into the 20th century. So one can actually go to these places. A number of the places they lived are still there and genuinely walk in your ancestors' footsteps. So let's look at someone else. So here we are, Williams, born in Bristol in 1942 and in fact given up for adoption. And so he did quite a lot of research on their adopted parents. And there's Victor, who's born in Gloucestershire, and Eileen, also born in Gloucestershire. Um, but we found, in fact, Victor had Welsh ancestors as well as English ancestors. Eileen had Irish ancestors as well as English ancestors. So did a lot of work and some very interesting stories there. But we also wanted to look at his natural parents, which he knew nothing about. So the first thing we do in those cases, we approach the adoption people and we got the actual birth certificate. It was called Peter Robson at that point, And his mother was Nora Robson. And it had an address and literally nothing else. And it was a real struggle to try and find the information, and a mixture of expertise and, and luck, perhaps. But what was interesting, we finally found, well, we got the breakthrough in the 1911 census, where we found Nora actually had just been born four months old. If she'd been born six months later, then we wouldn't have had this vital uh, bit of information to help us break through. And there we are, she's born in Newcastle, lived in the north of England and had come down south at some time. And there are her parents, Alfred and Margaret. So we're getting some information that we can go back in. And let's just look at the family. We went back further in time, but there's Alfred and Margaret, born Alfred Bywells to the west of Newcastle, Carlisle over in Cumberland. <clears throat> and there's Nora and, and Peter being born. And we found, in fact, four brothers and sisters of Nora. And we found Nora, after the Second World War, married and married Sidney Pito. Unfortunately, by the time we uh, did this research, they were both dead and they didn't have any children. But we found Lillian had married and we made contact with one of her sons. And he, of course, had known Nora, had all sorts of information and photographs. And so there, we were able to tell the client, here is a photo of your mother. And of course, absolutely thrilled. And it's great for us when we get that feeling that we really brought a lot of pleasure and satisfaction to, to our clients. <clears throat> and the sort of records we looked at, there's a note at the bottom, we start the adoption records, birth, marriage and death and sentences. The electoral rolls were very useful here in pinpointing exactly where people live. So let's just uh, give a general historical comment. I mean, the 19th century typically involved with virtually everyone we research. And England was amazing in the 19th century, and nothing more so than London. London in 1900 had become the world's largest city. It had grown seven times in the 1800s. 
very much uh, capital of the British Empire, global political, financial and trading capital. UK had 40% of the world's industrial capacity. But with rapid growth like that, there are downsides. And so a lot of people, particularly in the East End of London, were living in slums and overcrowded situations and so forth. And that could have been your ancestors. Uh, we look and find out. And then at the same time, the railways came in the 1900s and made a tremendous difference. The Metropolitan Police we take for granted now, they started in the early 1900s. So this is all part of what was going on around our ancestors. So let's look at someone where there's a London connection, but at first, John Shirts born in Birmingham in 1944. And his parents, equally are born in the Midlands, and it's Daniel, and Francis and the Nixons, in fact, were from Nottinghamshire, Northamptonshire, in the Midlands of England. And going back in time, there's Daniel, but there's his father's born in Stepney, in the east end of London, and there's the London connection. His father, again, born in Stepney. Um, and in fact, we trace back to the early 1700s, Southwark again is in London. Interesting story there, James died in Australia, in fact, emigrated, and there was a, a story there I won't go into now, <clears throat> but again, was very interesting, and we were able to trace relatives in Australia. But let's come back to John. And in fact, Daniel Shirt and Francis had married and had had another son, Daniel, born the year beforehand. And what was rather sad, they split up after the Second World War finished. And in fact, John went with his father and Daniel went with his mother. So we set out to try and find Daniel. And it was very difficult because, in fact, Francis had remarried someone called Fellows and Daniel had taken on that name. But eventually we tracked him down. And what was particularly poignant about this was, in fact, John Shirt had died, as you can see, a few months before his 50th wedding anniversary. And the brother of his wife thought it'd be a lovely gesture for a 50th anniversary to give her his ancestry and about his family. Well, we made contact with Daniel and found where he was living in phone number. In fact, we said to the, John's wife, here we are, you phone oh, Daniel or Roger as he was now, and that was amazing. Roger knew nothing about the family for 30 or 40 years. Uh, she was absolutely thrilled and they met up in due course and uh, um, were very, very happy. One of the factors there was typically the census is only released 100 years out. But with the Second World War building up, it was decided to take a 1939 register of all the people to help in coordinating the war effort. And this has recently been released. Now, if the person's still living, you can't get access to the information, but anyone over 100 years old or where they've certified death, then one can get access. So here we are in Birmingham, and we see Daniel Shirt with, in fact, Linda Shirt, his first wife. And there they are born in 1911 and what occupation they have. What we also found, though, was the his father, Daniel Shirt, born in 1872, still alive, and his wife, Ada Shirt. He remarried the family, knew absolutely nothing about this. So again, another addition to the story of the shirts and information bringing the whole family to life. One more then. I look at surnames and instinctively now think that sounds as though it's from Buchanan. Sounds a Scottish name to me, but Jean's born in Cambridgeshire. But sure enough, her father was born in Scotland. His father was born in Yorkshire but married in, in Bannockburn. And in fact, the, the Buchanan's were a Scottish family. There's a very interesting story about him going down to Yorkshire to be a gardener on a big estate. And again, there was a whole lot of uh, story about that. So let's look at that. And here's where the 1851 census played a part. We found John Buchanan in Eccles Hall. It's just outside Sheffield in 1851. And he's living with Jane Campbell, who's a housekeeper from Maybole in Ayrshire, and the four men there, all young male gardeners. And when we looked further in the census, higher up is John Campbell, age 34, born also in Maybole in Ayrshire, almost certainly the son of Jane Campbell, and he is a gardener, employing 30 men. So almost certainly John Buchanan and these others were working for 
John Campbell, 30 gardeners, that's a lot. There must have been a big estate. And then we found at the bottom of the census, George Wustenholm, manufacturer. Sheffield is known for steel. He, in fact, was a manufacturer of cutlery, clearly very successful, um, had a big estate and was able to employ 30 gardeners to look after that. So one of the things we did in the report was actually to find out a bit more about his company um, and add that as part of the uh, bringing to life of John Buchanan. So there's some examples and a background for you. So we'd be delighted to hear from you and to help you if you'd like us to research your ancestors and bring them to life. Here are our contact details, research through people. There's our website. Um, you can contact us and email us info at research through people. What we're doing to encourage people like yourselves is a 10% introductory discount. Just quote explore one. Uh, we'd be delighted to help you. We can promise you there will be some surprises but you are a lot of pleasure and information that you can share with your family about where you come from. So thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you.